Good afternoon, Angry Astronaut here with yet another unexpected and unscheduled bulletin in the field of space news, and thanks again to Lab Padre for the footage that they always allow me to use when I'm doing SpaceX updates, especially from Starbase. So, as I always really hoped would happen, it appears that SpaceX is finally giving up the ghost when it comes to launching Starship on a regular basis from Boca Chica. That doesn't mean the tests are going to completely come to a stop or anything like that, but I believe that we can expect Cadence to really get no faster than it currently is, and perhaps even slow down a bit, because the vast majority of Starship operations is obviously moving to Cape Canaveral based on a recent announcement from the FAA that I just received yesterday entitled SpaceX Starship Super Heavy Project to Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. Quote, The FAA intends to prepare an Environmental Impact Statement or EIS to evaluate the potential environmental impacts of issuing a commercial launch vehicle operator license to SpaceX for the Starship Super Heavy Launch Vehicle at Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. SpaceX proposes to construct, launch, land, and other associated infrastructure at and in proximity to LC-39A. The proposal would also include Starship Super Heavy launches at LC-39A, recoverable Super Heavy booster and Starship landings at LC-39A, or on a drone ship, an expendable Super Heavy booster and Starship landings in the ocean. SpaceX must obtain a vehicle operator license from the FAA for Starship Super Heavy launch and landing operations. Issuing a vehicle operator license and approving airspace closures is considered a major federal action under the National Environmental Policy Act. In consideration of SpaceX's revised proposal, National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the FAA have determined that an environmental impact statement or EI is the appropriate level of analysis to address the adjusted scope of Starship Super Heavy at LC-39A. SpaceX will prepare the EIS under supervision of the FAA, which will serve as the lead agency at NASA's request, while the 2019 EA prepared by NASA provides an analytical baseline. In other words, a previous EIS was done, but for far more restricted activities at Cape Canaveral, this is a lot more activity and let me explain why. The environmental impacts of these proposed changes to Starship Super Heavy LC-39A development and operations will be specifically analyzed in this EIS. So here is exactly what SpaceX has in mind, and I'll tell you, it's a very big deal. Within the context of the 2019 EA at Cape Canaveral, the scope of the proposed action was defined as an infrastructure development and Starship Super Heavy operations. Infrastructure development included construction of a launch mount, liquid methane farm, transport road, deluge water system, landing zone, and high pressure gaseous commodity lines. Operations involved approximately 24 Starship Super Heavy launches per year. That's quite a bit already, it's going to be a lot more. NASA's resultant finding of no significant impact issued on September 19, 2019 concluded that the environmental impacts associated with Starship Super Heavy infrastructure and operations would not have a significant impact on the quality of the biological or physical environment. However, while the purpose and need for Starship Super Heavy at LC-39A have not changed since 2019, the Starship Super Heavy concept of operations has evolved from the original 2019 scope. SpaceX now proposes to construct additional launch infrastructure not previously contemplated, launch an advanced design of the Starship and Super Heavy vehicle, so more advanced, maybe the Mark II or Mark threes that Elon was talking about also operate at a projected higher launch tempo and land
and the Super Heavy Booster at LC-39A in support of the reusability concept. Starship landings are no longer proposed to occur at Landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Now, how often are they going to be launching? Well, according to the FAA, quote, the SpaceX proposal includes constructing the necessary infrastructure to support up to 40 four launches per year from Launch Complex 39A with Super Heavy Booster and Starship Vehicle Recovery landings at LC-39A or on a drone ship or expending them in the ocean. 44 launches. Now let's compare that with the PEA that has been the subject of so many legal battles lately. The total number of projected annual super heavy launches at Boca Chica according to the FAA's recent documentation is five. Five launches per year from Boca Chica. And that was what it's been all along, clearly indicating that SpaceX never really intended for Boca to be a major spaceport. Or if they did, they changed their plans very quickly. Cape Canaveral is just set up far better to accommodate the launch of such a colossal rocket and all the dangers that go with it. And also the environmental considerations of launching a rocket of this size are well understood at Cape Canaveral and are not generally being disputed by any major environmental organizations. Although we can certainly expect some testing to continue at Boca Chica and lots of manufacturing, I think, in terms of actual regular launch operations and a frequent launch cadence, that is at an end. I don't think that SpaceX is really intended to do that for quite some time, especially given all the problems that they've been dealing with out there, both in terms of legal issues and also how much they've been stirring up public opposition to their activities. They have none of those problems out of Cape Canaveral, and so they are wisely moving their operations over there. Now, before I continue, I would like to thank the following awesome new Patreon members. First of all, from the land down under, and then Ulf Hannerberg. After that, we got Pamela Monroe and John Sicker. We also have John Morgan as a new member and John Heron as well. And then finally, we have Raleigh as a new member, but also quite a number of members upgraded their membership. For example, Drew edited his membership up. Holman Nixon just upgraded his membership. And on top of that, Naked Gardener OG, he upgraded his membership. Chris Garris upgraded his membership to a new classification called the Dream Chaser classification of membership, which, by the way, gives you an opportunity to choose a video topic on my new Patreon channel once per quarter. In addition to that, we also have MP58364 upgraded his membership. So great stuff indeed. All of these generous upgrades, new members working up to bring me to the equivalent of 1% of my subscribers supporting me at a $5 basis per member. And any way we can get to that, including people upgrading their existing memberships, all of that works and we actually just hit a milestone which will qualify the new channel for a new video, an exclusive video only for Patreon supporters. So if you're interested in any of these new developments, just check the description. Okay, on with Starliner and all the nonsense associated with that. Apparently there's a previous contractor or a contractor who didn't win a bid who's decided to go scorched 
scorched earth on Starliner. And as all of you know, I'm not a big supporter of Starliner. I'm not convinced that thing, this thing is going to be safe at all for our astronauts, but still, this whole situation is utterly ridiculous, and the way the media is treating it is equally ridiculous. Valve Tech CEO Aaron Faville is urging NASA to cancel the launch of Boeing's crewed Starliner, quote, due to the risk of disaster, unquote. Now, NASA contractors almost never do this sort of thing, especially when a rocket is sitting on the pad, but Valve Tech is. In 2011, Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne, now known as Aerojet Rocketdyne, hired Valve Tech to build valves for the Starliner's propulsion system. After disputes over design between the two firms, Aerojet ended the relationship in 2017, and Valve Tech sued the company for violating non disclosure closure agreements and misusing its trade secrets to design new valves. Now that, I believe Boeing would actually do. Anyway, after years of motions, depositions, and a trial, a jury found in November that Aerojet had violated NDAs with Valve Tech, but hadn't misappropriated any trade secrets. Valve Tech was awarded $850,000 in damages, but it sought further restrictions on Aerojet and court fees. However, on May 6, just a few days ago, a U.S. District Court judge denied those motions and closed the case. And almost immediately thereafter, Ms. Faville said that she was concerned that the Aerojet build valves on Starliner were not properly qualified for human flight. She said she communicated that to NASA and to Boeing. Now, apparently, the problem was with the valve that was making a buzzing noise. And in her opinion, and apparently in the opinion of other engineers at her company, that buzzing sound could suggest deeper problems with the space capsule. However, this is an absurd assertion. Let me tell you why. The valve in question that was making this noise was on the Centaur upper stage of the Atlas rocket. It has nothing to do with Starliner. And believe me, I am the last person on this planet who's going to leap to Starliner's defense or to Boeing's defense. And yeah, it's very possible that all of the issues with these lawsuits, changing contractors in midstream, etc., led to a lot of the valve problems that Starliner has experienced, but this particular valve has nothing to do with Starliner. It's exclusively to do with the Atlas V rocket, and ULA is fixing it. And here's what Tori Bruno had to say, quote, Close to none of it is correct, Re referring to the story, not urgent, not leaking, etc. Remarkable that the particular person quoted doesn't seem to know how this type of valve works. And he's absolutely right. There is no way that Tori Bruno is going to take any sort of unnecessary chances with astronauts' lives on this launch. ULA is having enough problems as it is, and Tori's not the kind of guy to put astronauts' lives in danger anyway. He's a very cautious individual. There's no way that there's any part of this story that has any credibility whatsoever, and I'm very disappointed that the media is giving this story any sort of public exposure whatsoever. I mean, I have contacts with a direct association with this project and with this launch, and I'll tell you, if there was anything dangerous about it whatsoever, they would tell me about that, and they haven't. This is going to be as safe a launch as possible. Well, as, as far as Starliner is concerned, there's always going to be things that are going to make me a little nervous, but nevertheless, this latest valve issue is a ULA issue, not a Starliner issue, and I'm 100% confident that ULA will get it fixed. Thanks very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.